Welcome back, everybody. In this video, we're going to be exploring a new branch of psychology in social psychology. And to do this, much like we did when talking about memory and intelligence research and other areas of psychology, we're going to focus in on not just the broad idea of social psychology, but very popular topics that have been explored over the history of social psychology research. And in doing so, hopefully give you some of the framework that you might want to have if you decide to take a social psychology course in the future or just apply some of the stuff that you're learning from this class in your own life. Now, before we get into the topic of social perception, I do want to just take a step back and define for the class what social psychology is all about. This is really important to do since social psychology is one of the fastest growing and most popular areas of psychology over the last few decades. So having an understanding of how it fits in the grand scheme of things and what makes a social psychologist a social psychologist is probably pretty important. And if we're looking at what defines a social psychologist, we struggle a little bit sometimes. And this is because social psychologists can look at a lot of different things. But at the heart of most social psychology research is what's sort of embedded within this branch of psychology's name. Looking at the social world. Looking at how things around us are impacting us. What it can impact varies dramatically when people in social psychology look at different topics. Some can look at how our thoughts are impacted by things, others can talk about emotions, others can talk about behaviors, or they can talk about sort of the interplay between all of these things and how they play out in our daily interactions in the social world. There are also social psychologists that focus their attention on groups, and as we're going to talk about a little bit later, can even expand out to cultures where we start to merge the research of social psychologists with another group of people studying human behavior called sociologists. The merger between these is not always smooth and there's sometimes fine details and the differences between say a sociologist or a social psychologist but in overall what I want you to get from this is that social psychologists can explore a lot but they're always usually doing it in the context of just trying to understand how the social world around us is impacting us and how we in turn are impacting that social world. And this is where we get to today's topic, what we call social perception, one of the very first areas explored by social psychologists over a century ago. When social psychology was starting to form as a branch of psychology, one of the questions that people started to ask was how those cognitions that we'd been studying for a long time are impacted by the social world around us and how that shapes a lot of the behaviors and things that we do later on. And this led to a lot of researchers studying this topic that they decided to call social perception. And when they did that, they had a lot of questions that they wanted to ask. One of the questions that started to pop up a lot was, when do we start to try to make sense of the world around us, either others or situations or even ourselves? Another question that started to come up right after that was, well, when we are making these judgments, what are we doing? How are we defining who we are, what a situation is like? And are there real differences when we talk about ourselves, others, groups, whole societies, these questions really did spurn on a lot of research trying to not only describe what people were doing, but come up with definitions to kind of explain the path that most of us take in the social world that's surrounding us. And this path is what we're sort of going to go down as we go through today's lecture on social perception. And we're going to start when we're taking this journey on one of the first questions you see here. When do we try to make sense of our social world? So when do we make judgments about situations or other individuals around us? Uh, much to many individual surprises when we first started dissecting this, most researchers concluded that instead of taking a long time to dissect what a person's like or how a situation is going to play out, we tend to just 
jump to the first conclusion we can in a lot of these different instances. And it leads to something that many social psychologists have called the primacy effect. Now you might remember when we were in the memory section, us discussing another primacy effect. And we talked about the fact that we tended to remember the first bits of stories and the first parts of movies and the beginning of classes a little bit better than the rest of the content that we were presented. Well, this is sort of exactly what the primacy effect is for social psychology as well. It's just a slight difference as now we're looking at our judgments and kind of how we then perceive everything else after those judgments are made. The primacy effect suggests that when we meet somebody or when we find ourselves in a situation, we quickly use our base knowledge that we have in that situation, the first things we encountered, and, and, and sort of lean on that for a very long period of time after we've encountered those things. It means if the first impression you have of somebody you meet is that they're funny, and then that's probably going to have a lot more weight on future judgments that you have of that individual, and it's just going to be your way of defining them for a long period of time. If we, say, walk into a classroom that we find very interesting or very scary, the primacy effect suggests that there's going to need to be a lot of counter-information before we change our mind about those things when we're making sense of our social world. And there's lots of real life examples for where not only we see the primacy effect working, but people sort of intuitively being aware of it. My favorite example is something that some of you might have encountered when you were a young child. Some of us, much like myself, might have been forced into wearing really kind of fancy clothes on the first day of school a suit or a dress or something in between that sort of indicated that we were going to be well-mannered, hopefully respectful children. Now, why would we do this? Why would parents force us to do this? Well, there's a chance that our parents had this intuitive notion that if a teacher on the first day of school or a principal on the first day of school judged us in that way, and those judgments could carry a lot more weight as we progress throughout school. And, and to be fair to your parents or whoever else did this to you, there does seem to be a lot of research that supports these assumptions that your parents or caregivers had. It might lead you to another question of why? You know, why in the world would this effect be so unbelievably strong? Well, it's important to note that there are occasions where the primacy effect doesn't stick. I'm guessing many of you can remember friends that you didn't like right off the bat that you eventually grew to like. Or maybe you had situations that you felt very differently about the first time you encountered them. You know, for most situations, this primacy effect does stick. And again, it leads to that question of why? Why do things last so long? One of the explanations that's been given by social psychologists is this idea of something called self-fulfilling prophecies. It's this identification that once we start to assume something about somebody or a situation, those assumptions usually carry weight behind our actions. So if we find somebody funny or interesting, we'll do things to them that sort of indicate our beliefs that they are funny or interesting. And more than likely than not, when we start treating them in that way, they're going to start manifesting those behaviors based on the expectations we've placed on them. And this can be a really powerful effect. One of my favorite studies that really highlighted how powerful this was, was a study done way back in 1977 by a trio of researchers that never really got much acclaim, but I still think it's worth covering in an intro class. In this study, they invited heterosexual male and females to come in and participate in what they called a phone conversation study. They told the males and females that all they were really interested in was just seeing how heterosexual individuals would communicate with somebody of the opposite sex that they've never met if they were only to communicate over the phone and not have anything else to rely on. To really run this study, they 
put men and women into separate rooms and gave them all these specific instructions about what they could say, what they couldn't say, how long it would last, and little details about you know, who would call who. For the most part, everybody got pretty much the same exact instructions. You know, everybody was paired up with one random individual, and they were all told that they needed to just keep the conversation casual, and they were reminded that they were going to be recorded throughout the entire time. But what they didn't tell the participants was they threw a little wrinkle into the study right before it was about to start. For all the females, when they were given the instructions, they were just told to sit by the phone and wait for a call. But for the males, they were told right before the experiment was about to start, and they were about to give them the number for the, the, the female that they were going to call, that they, they wanted to add a little bit to the study. The researchers indicated that there had been some discomfort in the original conversations and that they wanted to make sure that these conversations went smoothly. So they told the gentleman in this study that they were going to sneak over to the room of the female that they were going to talk with, Mind you, this was before cell phones, so they had all of these people placed in front of those normal rotary phones that we had back in the 1970s. So they told the males they would sneak over to the room of the female that they were about to talk to and snap a little Polaroid picture of them, give it to the males so the males had at least a sense of who they were going to speak with. And they said something along the lines of, you know, this should hopefully ease some tension. But they also insisted at these males that to maintain the integrity of the study, the males couldn't mention the fact that they'd seen the picture of the women, because the women weren't going to be theoretically told that their picture was taken. So they did walk out of the room and come back with a Polaroid picture. But unfortunately, well, I don't know if it's unfortunately, but uh, I guess not to, to the knowledge of the males, this picture was not of the female they were going to talk with. Half the participants in the study got a picture of a female that was rated overall by a number of different raters as attractive. And the other half of the male participants got a photo of a female that was not attractive. The, the, the same exact photo for all the males in the two groups. Then mind you, these photos had nothing to do with the woman they were about to talk with, but they were told that these photos were indeed of the woman they were going to speak with. And as you could probably imagine, if you've ever been around heterosexual college-age males, their behaviors did change a little bit based on who they thought they were going to talk with. Whether or not they saw a picture of an attractive female or an unattractive female and were told they were going to have this conversation changed some of the dynamics of their behavior. The ones that were randomly paired with an attractive face were, well, much more flirty, much more... I don't know how to explain it, uh, I guess loud, uh, outgoing. They, they did things that you would typically expect a person to do when they were trying to flirt with a member of the opposite sex, or I guess of the same sex for that matter, but again, this was all heterosexual males and females that were a part of this study. For the males that were paired up with uh, somebody that was uh, supposed to be unattractive. Again, mind you, this was simply just a random photo that they were given that was not of the person they were going to talk with. Well, their behavior was somewhat predictable. They were sort of aloof, sort of quiet, sort of cold, and certainly not talking about maybe going out to get drinks or doing something after the experiment. All this was sort of expected. But what Snyder, Tank, and Bershaib were really interested in was how these sort of anticipated behaviors of the males impacted the females on the other side of the line. So what they did in this study was not only record the entire conversation, but they ensured that they could remove the male side of the conversation from each conversation. So they would have these recordings of each individual female in the study just talking to some unknown person about well, something that's slightly unclear. And what they did from this, these recordings of the females, was they played them back to people who had no idea what the experiment was all about. And they asked the people to do something kind of odd, kind of weird, that probably made a large number of them extremely uncomfortable. They asked them to just guess how attractive they thought the females they were listening to were, simply based on the way they spoke, the way they presented themselves, and other things that they could maybe glean from the, the conversation that they were listening to. And what was really surprising to Snyder, Tank, and Burscheid 
is that for many of the females in the study, their own personal level of attractiveness was often very highly outweighed by the level of attractiveness of the photo that they were randomly paired up with. <sighs> we want to just bring this around to the self-fulfilling prophecies. What that means is that the expectations placed on them by the males that they were speaking to had so much of an effect on their own behaviors that people who had no idea what the study was all about judged these females on their attractiveness levels based on what was sort of expected of them more than what they'd had or what they'd been going with for a large portion of their life. That's really a powerful effect. Right? It highlights how important expectations of others on us are when we look at our own behaviors and what we display. And I want you to think about that the next time you find yourself in social interactions. If you treat a friend or a teacher <clears throat> or just somebody else in a specific way based on preconceived notions that you have, well, those treatments do impact the way these individuals will respond to you. And oftentimes it will bring about those expectations that you have. Now, if the expectations are accurate or fair, that's one thing. But if they're inaccurate or unfair, this is when we can start to run into problems. And this gets us to some other stuff that was discussed in this social perception area. When we start talking about making judgments of others and treating them in specific ways, it's very quickly led to research on a very popular topic even today called stereotypes. And the generalized beliefs or expectations that we have of members of different groups. Now, early stereotype research did focus on big things like race and gender and age, some of the same things that we're still studying today when we run stereotype research. But as stereotype research started to progress, people did go into more subtle things that kind of expanded our definitions of what stereotypes were all about. Nowadays, in social psychology, we talk about stereotypes being just generalizations that we have of individuals regardless of whether or not these generalizations are positive, neutral, or negative. And we do, in social psychology, say that if these generalizations about specific groups are somewhat accurate, they might actually help us navigate in the world around us. But it's the unfair stereotypes, it's the inaccurate ones that are big problems. Let's say if you meet somebody who says they're a member of a janitorial group and you assume then that they're probably pretty good at fixing things and repairing stuff, well, you're technically operating in a stereotype when you're using that assumption, but it's not necessarily that you're really off with some of those assumptions more often than not. And unfortunately, in our real social world, we do have lots of stereotypes that are not only unfair, but extremely inaccurate. And on the surface, that's problematic on its own, but what makes these things even more problematic and a source of a lot of research is that these stereotypes are often followed by two things. One of the things that comes about once we have different stereotypes is what we call prejudices. Prejudices, much like stereotypes, can technically be positive, negative, or neutral, but usually when we're doing prejudice research, we're focusing on the negative prejudices that people have about members of specific groups. And if we're defining prejudices, these are not the assumptions we have about groups, but the attitudes we form about groups and members of a group simply because they're a part of that group or simply because of the stereotypes that we hold of those groups. And those prejudices, those attitudes, often are followed by another big thing that comes up called discrimination. Or we start unfairly or unjustly or just kind of expectation-based treating somebody in a specific way simply because they're a member of that group. Again, you can technically discriminate based on positive stereotypes or neutral stereotypes, but most research focuses on the negative, a negative discrimination that we have of individuals. And again, just to highlight and, and remind us, if we have stereotypes about groups that sort of make sense or logical, it's not a huge problem every time, 
when we operate on those stereotypes. But when we have stereotypes that are false or problematic, and they lead to issues with discrimination or prejudice, that's when we can start to run into lots and lots of problems. Ones that we have apparently seen over and over again in our world. And to test how abundant these are, how much these have impacted individuals and how easily we can create them. Numerous researchers have set out and established careers trying to really dissect this topic. But one of the most popular individuals in our history of research on stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination is actually a person who never earned her PhD in psychology, never really set out, well, I guess she technically did get a PhD eventually, but somebody who started out actually as a career instead as an elementary school educator, a woman by the name of Jane Elliott, who ran her first, we could maybe study studies, but more they were lessons on this topic with her third grade class from Riceville, Iowa, a very small town in the middle of the United States. After a couple times when she ran these sessions with her children, Elliot expanded this kind of lesson to allow researchers and television producers to film one of her classes. And it eventually led to the development of a video, a short movie called The Eye of the Storm. And another 20, 30 years later, a reproduction of this video was made where they interviewed people who had been in the original study and sort of followed up with Jane Elliott as her career progressed and was called a class divided. Now, if we were taking this as an in-person class, we would watch this video and see Elliot splitting her children up in half, well, sort of in half, not based on some of the more prominent stereotypes that we think of these days, but on kind of odd, awkward one, the color of the children's eyes. You would see in this video her instructing the kids to kind of treat each other differently based on the color of each other's eyes suggesting that things like intelligence and intelligence, intelligence uh, and impulsiveness and other types of, kind of positive slash negative behaviors are tied to something as simple as the color of eyes. She used these suggestions and the things that occurred afterward as a lesson, a launching pad for a lesson for her kids about how easily we can discriminate against others, even our friends, and how impactful this discrimination can be when it's placed on us. I encourage you to watch either The Eye of the Storm or Class Divided at some point in time. But I do need to warn you, and this is why we actually don't usually include this in the in-person class anymore, and if we do, I have to hedge a lot. There is some pretty offensive and kind of dramatic language included in this. And it's a byproduct of when this was filmed and some of the things that people were saying back then, not just in secret, but very overtly. And sadly, there's still lots of people saying these things overtly today, but it's just less prominent, less common that you would see it in a video or said by a very young child, like we saw in this video, The Eye of the Storm. But again, if you've got a chance, you're willing, I encourage you to watch it because it really does explore this topic of social perception around the, the conversation of stereotypes and how we grow to judge others and how impactful this can be for those that are judged. Now, I know we can dive deeper into that topic of stereotypes and prejudice. And in fact, in the social psychology class that I often teach, and we have other faculty that teach, we do spend not only a class, but oftentimes multiple classes on that specific topic. But since we're in an intro class and we're focusing not just on that one topic, but this idea of social perception, I do want to also look at some other avenues that social psychologists have gone down when trying to understand how we're making sense of the world around us. And this leads us to a really important term that has been used in a lot of different areas of social psychology a term that's called attributions, sort of an attempt to understand the world around us by doing things like assigning cause or some type of explanation for what it is we're seeing. 
What most attribution researchers have looked at is how, when we encounter a situation, either seeing somebody act in another person or just seeing an outcome that somebody's experienced, is trying to understand how we make sense of those outcomes, how we kind of attribute blame or <clears throat> cause to those things. And when we talk about attribution research, there's a lot of different terms that have been floated around over the years, but if we want to sort of minimize the terms that we want to learn, there's two big ones that we need to cover in an intro class. The first term is something called an internal attribution, where when we're making sense of why somebody did something or what happened to somebody, we blame those outcomes on the person themselves. We say, assume that somebody struggling with a test did it because of some skill level that they had or some inherent level of intelligence that they possessed. Or if somebody did something great, we assume that it's because of some enduring characteristic within them. In essence, we blame the actions of the actor on the actor themselves, not something surrounding them. If we decide to blame the actions of somebody on a situation, something that was kind of prompting them to do it or which prompted everybody to do it, we call this type of an attribution an external attribution. Let's say for the example we had earlier where somebody struggled on a test like we see in the image up in front of us. Instead of saying that that struggle was because of their skills or inherent intelligence, was instead because of the time they had, or the, the quality of the teacher, or the other issues going on at home. We're making those things, well, things we call external attributions. And when we define these concepts, one of the places that people started to go was to try to figure out which one we did more often, and what led us to these different attributions that we could make when we were trying to understand the situation around us. And now that we've defined those two types of attributions, one might be asking themselves, what one do we use in most situations? And when we see somebody getting a bad grade on an exam, or when we see somebody getting into a fight with a roommate, or just simply see somebody doing what they do on any given day, do we have a penchant for making one type of attribution over another? Now, if we go back about 50, 60 years and actually see a number of models that were introduced to try to give us a sense of how to best make sense of um, every situation, how we could make accurate or useful attributions when we encounter something in the world around us. It's also important to note that a lot of those models that we were coming up with seemed to fly in the face of something numerous researchers were finding time and time again in the 50s and 60s. It was the fact that when people judged others, they didn't usually use any models. Instead, what more often than not happened was people engaged in something that was at the time called the fundamental attribution error. Sometimes you might see it listed in textbooks and other places nowadays as the correspondence bias. It's this tendency for us to, when we see somebody acting, regardless of whether or not what they're doing is positive, negative, neutral, or something in between, we assume that those person's actions are a byproduct of who they are. Or, if we're going back to the attribution terms, we make internal attributions when we see somebody acting. And what's really amazing with this fundamental attribution error is that there's numerous studies that have cited and shown that even in the face of lots of evidence that we should be making external attributions, we nonetheless still have a penchant to make internal ones. One of the classic studies that highlighted this was a study done by two researchers way back in 1967, where they brought participants in, forced them to write essays about whether or not they liked or disliked Fidel Castro, and they couldn't write just what they felt, but what they were assigned to write, and then these same participants, after being forced to write specific essays about this very polarizing individual back in the 60s, then read the essays of others and were asked to 
try to piece through all the different things that these other people wrote so they can get a sense of how much these people did or didn't like Castro, being oftentimes reminded that, much like themselves, these people were forced to write these essays. But nonetheless, Jones and Harris found what many teachers and classes have been able to reproduce, that when people were pushed, they tended to assume that whatever somebody did, like, like these essays, was more about themselves and the situation they found themselves in. This obviously runs very counter to logic. It's odd to think that when we see somebody doing something, we almost never give them the benefit of the doubt or just assume it's situational, and instead just jump to conclusions about that person. At least, we assume that this was the case for everybody for quite some time. But then a couple decades later, when we started to open up the scope of who we were studying, going beyond just college students in the United States, we stumbled upon something that was kind of interesting. And that was the fact that even though we call this thing the fundamental attribution error, it's not quite as fundamental across different cultures or within different groups. And in fact, in East Asian cultures or South Asian cultures as well, they tend to reverse this specific effect. One of the leading champions on these findings was a person that used to work at UC Berkeley named Kai Ping Pong. He spent many years with another researcher named Michael Morris, trying to explain where differences in people's attributions were coming from when he compared East Asian individuals to people from the United States and what we call Western cultures. He looked at things like what our focus was on how we made sense of ourselves, how we made sense of the world around us. And he was able to reveal a much more elaborate story than we had originally thought. It's also important to note that Pong wasn't the only one that had identified a little bit of an issue with this fundamental attribution error. The issue that we saw with the fundamental attribution error was when we stopped making judgments of others, but instead made judgments of ourselves. When we were asked to explain why we did specific things, many social psychologists found that instead of going with a knee-jerk reaction of internal attributions, we tended to blame a lot of our own behaviors on the situation. And this eventually led to something that we called the actor-observer effect the notion that the closer and closer we got to ourselves or somebody we knew, our attributions tended to shift from internal attributions to external ones. One of the classic studies that highlighted how this could work was one done back in 1970 by a pair of researchers named Jones and Nesbitt. In this study, they asked participants to come in, write down their own names, write down the name of a family member, also, I don't have it listed here, but I'm pretty sure most of the iterations had individuals writing down the name of a best friend. And then they used a name of a very popular individual back in the 1970s named Walter Cronkite. For the probably 75 plus percent of you that's never heard of Walter Cronkite, he was a very famous newscaster at the time. He was considered by many to be the most trusted name in news, and he would come on nightly just presenting the details of the daily events. And what Jones and Nesbitt did with these individuals was they would pair them up with specific situations, specific events. They'd say stuff like, you got into a car accident, or your neighbor, sorry, your friend got into a fight with a neighbor, or Walter Cronkite uh, got caught cheating on an exam. And not, not all of them were negative, like the examples I just gave. Some of them were neutral, some of them were positive. And they just asked people to explain what could have probably led to these things occurring. And what they found was that for Walter Cronkite, much like we talked about with the fundamental attribution error, everything that Cronkite did, positive, neutral, or negative, tended to be blamed on the newscaster. For their friends, for their family member, well, more often than not, their behaviors tended to be blamed on them. But there were instances where well, now these behaviors were attributed to the situation, to social factors that could have led up to these things. But when these individuals started talking about their own behaviors, especially for the negative and neutral ones, they tended to blame those things 
on the situation. Now that one little nuance to that is something I also want to focus on, because it highlights another effect that Jones and Nesbitt and others had discovered in the 1960s and 70s. It was the fact that even though most of us can admit the actor-observer effect in most situations, when we talk about positive things, positive outcomes, even though we tend to attribute positive things to others internally, just like we do for negative and neutral things, this actor-observer effect, where we're blaming things on the situation for ourselves, no longer works. Instead, we tend to make internal attributions when we accomplish something that's considered relatively positive. Going back to an example we had before, what that means is if we see somebody doing poorly on a test, we're assuming they're not that bright. If they do well on a test, we're assuming they're pretty smart. If we do poorly on a test, like the actor-observer effect suggests, we blame it on things like a lack of study time or bad questions, or just a horrible teacher, or whatever, situational factors that don't really give an indication of who we are. But, the self-serving bias suggests that if we do well on that exam, if we get a good grade, well, then suddenly we're more inclined to make internal attributions. We don't blame it on the teacher, or the ease of the questions, and it's suddenly more an indicator of how smart we are, and how good we are at test-taking. And this self-serving bias does work for most individuals, but it's important to note before we close out with these terms and you start applying them, that we identify that much like we talked about with the fundamental attribution error, researchers have found exceptions to this. Numerous studies have linked different mental health issues with kind of the reverse of this self-serving attribution bias. Cultural studies have shown, much like we saw with the fundamental attribution error, reverses or just not as robust of an effect when we go to things like East Asian, South Asian, more collectivist cultures. Other studies have also shown that age is a huge determinant of how inclined we are to make different types of attributions. And all of these relatively new discoveries have given us a sense that these things that social psychologists used as sort of their framework to understand why we do things and how we make sense of the world around us, a little bit more nuanced than we had originally thought. Well, that gives you an insight as to how social psychology has grown and expanded since some of these early concepts have been explored for almost 80 years at this point. I think this is a great place to sort of wrap up. If we were in person, we'd be really pushed for time because I would have shown you a couple quick videos and really highlighted some of the stuff that we have. But I think we've covered enough in what we saw here. I think we were able to hopefully get a grasp of what social psychology was all about, the sense of this topic of social perception, talk about what social perception is, what things are tied to it, and how when we start talking about social perception, not just for others, but groups and ourselves, the story gets significantly more complicated. If we've done that, I think we've covered some pretty important stuff that not only gives you a better sense of social psychology research, but some things that you might be able to apply this information for in your own life. We're going to hope to try to do that exact same thing when we get into our next class. In particular, in our next class, we're going to explore another topic within social psychology called social influence. We're going to be looking at how specific things and factors shape some of the behaviors that we display in different environments. And it's all going to be building up to looking at the extreme that we can sometimes get people to go to when we do have a lot more power over the situation that people encounter. But for now, I'm going to bid you adieu. Hope you're all doing well, and as always, wish you the best, and hope to see you soon. Take care, everyone.